So, <laughs> oh well. Um, so that's true for all L. And um, <sighs> I miss my old office. So that's true for all L. In particular, it's true for the, it's particular, it's true for the set of indices which the C's are non-zero for, right? So it gives you that like Cij B, let's say IK, is equal to BIK C um, I J, right? And those are all non-zero. Well, they have to be non-zero because, do they have to be non-zero? Well, this is non-zero, that's non-zero. These are supposed to be different letters, my bad. Um, Goodness gracious. So I, I believe, I believe if I can, you know, suspend my doubt for a second here, that that implies that C, uh, Cij not equal to zero implies that Bij is not equal to zero. But on the flip side of things, if the on the flip side of things, if you have CL equals to zero, right, then you've got C I J B sub L equal to B I J C L. Now this is equal to zero. Keep in mind these are just numbers. So that implies that the b sub l is also equal to zero since since that's non-zero that has to be zero so what does all this mean this means that these two um, dual vectors right they have to be non-zero in the same components so what that means then is that we've got s1 is equal to the sum over let's say i equals to ij of you know c ci and and uh well let me just say some over some over ij all right cij e i sub j and and likewise s2 is equal to the sum over these particular indices b i j e i j Um, and I believe then it follows that they're linearly dependent. I guess that's not clear yet. <laughs> Maybe it's already clear from the equations I have here. I just don't I need to actually implement them. So now we only have the components are non-zero in the same dual directions. Um, but we also have this mess of intertwining relations between, right? Like, <clears throat> um, okay, so let me just. So what this all speaks to is the fact that if you really want to do this stuff, you need to invent some, some machinery to, to deal with these problems. Like this is, this is obviously, um, there's there's a lot of patterns and and really nice um, what's the word there's lots of nice patterns here that we could exploit if we had a system for doing it and and there is a larger discussion to be had here which I'm not going to have in this course um, I mean you asking this question today it's a really good question but I think we're we're running up against the fact that it's difficult to answer with our current perspective. And that's okay. We'll get there. So this one, since these are all non-zero, right? We got to that. That means I can solve for, for example, for BIK is equal to, well, CIK 
divided by Cij um, Bij, right? And so well, I, I want to stop. <laughs> I really want to stop this, but I, I'm trying to get to a good stopping point. I can just plug these into there, right? And um, so if you've got like, you know, C1, well, more to the point, if you've got S2 is equal to the sum over these indices, right? And my B, I, I can solve that for, um, oh, I seem to have solved for the wrong one. Oh, well, I'll, I'll make do. That's going to be C. Well, goodness gracious, that's true for all. <sighs> I don't think I fully appreciated what that means entirely, right? This is, this is true, like bi1 is equal to ci1 over what? cij bij, right? But that is, that's true for all j. So that's like CI1 over CI2 BI2, CI1 over CI3 BI3, right? Dot, 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 CI1 over CI, whatever my stupid notation was. I had S of them, right? Um, BIS. So there, there's a relation between all of the non-zero coefficients. Um, uh, um, so if I let if I let b i one equal to just say b, right? then you see from this that b i j is equal to you know some constant k times b for every um, well i guess the k is a is a what <sighs> Son of a gun. k depends on um, the, the, I guess this, where the Kij is the ratio of Cij and C1. Anyway, if I had my head screwed on straight today, you could see that you can prove that the one dual vector is just a scalar multiple of the other. And that, of course, would contradict the, the linear independence. Goodness gracious. Yowzers, man. Whew, you surprised me with this question today. It was a good question, Ernesto, but uh, I am, I, uh, sorry, I, 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 there's a way to do this in a less stupid way. I do think we're approaching it in generally the right manner, but it's, I'm not satisfied with our current attack. I'm going to go on, though, because I feel like I'm spinning my wheels. But it is if and only if. It is if and only if. And so that is, you see, then, if you had a wedge product at the start of your linear algebra course, right, you could use it to characterize linear independence of sets of vectors. And it might, I think it's, it's going to be interesting for us to look at this um, Let's, let's actually look at this and try to understand it a little bit more concretely. So for instance, um, if we were in, I guess that would make a really good homework problem, by the way. I, I feel like that the, I feel like you prove it for two and then prove it by induction, probably. Mm -hmm. um, eh.
I also think you may you may need to introduce this thing where you we have this evaluation map sometimes called hook where what that does is it just evaluates one of the uh, one of the inputs to the tensor so it might take like a, uh, a type 3 0 tensor and drop it to a type 2 0 by evaluating on one of the components and sometimes you can you can prove things about that evaluation map and um, well anyway the fact that my proof descended to coordinates there is probably a little telling mm. all right so example two let's look at e1 wedge e2 on let's let that act on um, a pair of um, vectors let's say you know uh, xyz um, oh I don't know ABC so we know what that does that's e1 of xyz e2 of abc minus e2 of xyz right e1 of abc so what's that equal to Uh huh. Very good. Right. And on the other hand, let me call these th let me call these two vectors like uh, um, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna be like v1 and v2. Okay. So what if we did like um, e1 wedge e3? with v1, v2, what would that give us by the same, essentially same calculation? Right. And what would e2 wedge e3 on v1, v2 give us? Why? Sorry. Yeah. Why? C. Oh, that was bad. That was supposed to be a, a C, right? Yeah. Uh, y, YC minus Z, Z B, right? Yeah. Okay, so if you think about the matrix, right, X, A, Y, B, Z, C, right? What are these three quantities? Those are the determinants. The, the determinants of the... The upper... Right. That's that one. Yeah. And yeah, this one is that one, right? And the middle one is <laughs> these two. So they're the determinants of the submatrices. So to say, to say that like, E, um, so if you have, if you have alpha wedge beta, right, and it's equal to zero, if you have these two dual vectors wedged to zero, what does it mean? Well, if you think about the wedge product, you can write alpha wedge beta as what? You can write it as like, you know, alpha 1 beta 2 E1 wedge E2 
plus, you know, um, well, fine, let me, let me just, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm thinking about something here. Well, so alpha wedge beta, fine, before, I mean, I'm in three dimensions at the moment, so I could write it as like alpha 1 E1 plus alpha 2 E2 plus alpha 3 E3 wedge what? Beta 1 E1 plus beta 2 E2 plus beta 3 3, right? That equal to zero. And, um, well, you know how it all goes. You got, you know, Alpha 1 wedge, like a lot of these things are zero because like E1 wedge E1 is zero, E2 wedge E2 is zero, E3 wedge E3 is zero, but on the other hand we have alpha 1, sorry, I'm not trying to get you, um, alpha 1 beta 2 minus alpha 2 beta 1 E1 wedge E2, right? And then 1, 3, I've got like alpha 1, uh, beta 3 minus beta 1 alpha 3, my bad, wrote them weird, and E1 wedge E3 plus, um, you know, like alpha 2 beta 3 minus alpha 3 beta 2 E2 wedge E3, all that's equal to zero. But my larger point is just this. Um, if I have a you know, if I have a two form, no, that's not what I say. So if I have that's equal to zero, you know, what does that mean in terms of what does that mean in terms of these subdeterminants? Um, I'm trying to get at here. So I'm trying to, th I'm, I'm trying to, I'm trying to understand the proof we were just doing, or half doing, in terms of this specific example, okay? Like, um, all right, so, ah. I think I, I think I have the wrong perspective at the moment. Maybe I need to be making a different claim. I mean, this calculation is fine. It's not wrong, but maybe I, maybe I need to make a different claim that's more direct. And so like, here's a claim. If, um, you know, E1 wedge E2, E1 wedge E3 and E2 wedge E3, all um, act on V1, V2 to give zero, then um, V1, V2 is linearly dependent. That's what I want. See, because if V1, if, if all of these wedge products are zero, right? So if I, if I put my V1 and V2 equal to X, Y, Z, A, B, C, like I have over here, right? The, the vanishing of all three of those wedge products is tantamount to the determinant of, I mean, let's, let's sort through it. Let's see how that works. So we have 
you know, I'm gonna, again, I'm gonna let V1 and V2 be as, as I wrote them over there. X, Y, Z, V2, A, B, C. And let's sort through what these different determinants mean. On the one hand, we have the determinant of X, A, Y, B equals to zero. We have the determinant of X, A, Z, C equals to zero. We have the determinant of Y, B, Z, C equals to zero, right? We have all three of these subdeterminants are zero. Now, this one, the first one, tells me that these two-dimensional vectors, right? It tells me that these two-dimensional vectors are linearly dependent. So without loss of generality, let me suppose that the uh, x, y can be written as you know, a constant times a, b, right? And likewise here, I'm going to have like x, z can be some constant times a, c, right? And down here, I'm going to have that y, z can be written as some constant times b, c. But if you have all three of these at once, they're interlaced. You know what I mean? Like, on the one hand, you have, you have x is equal to k1a is equal to k2a. And here you have z is equal to k2c um, is equal to k3c. So these give us that k1 and k2 is equal to k3 which then gives me that V1 is a multiple of V2. Now, um, admittedly, I've got some case-wise logic I probably need to sort through in terms of K, what if K is zero? All that stuff, you know? But that's basically what's going on, is if, if, if the determinant is zero and one subdeterminant, that does not, depi that, that does not de um, imply linear dependence of the whole three-dimensional vector, but it does, it does imply a linear dependence of that sub, that, those two components of the vector, right? And if you can do that for all possible selections of two components in a three-component vector, then it implies there is linear dependence. And so, and this calculation isn't really special to three dimensions, right? You can do the same thing on an n-dimensional vector if you have all, how many, how many subdeterminants are there? And so for three, there were three subdeterminants. For n, there's n subdeterminants for two vectors. I guess there's always n. Is that true? Yeah. Well. Yeah. Well, this is the interesting thing, right? What if, you do, what if you did three vectors in three dimensions, right? Well, that is literally just, it works out to the determinant of V1, V2, V3, right? And so when you look at what that is, there's just, <laughs> there's just the one determinant to consider. Now, if you were looking at three vectors and you had four dimensions, if you're looking at three vectors in a four-dimensional space, then the three wedge, you'd be like looking at three by three subdeterminants of four-dimensional vectors, and you'd have four to sort through. If all four were zero, it would imply those three four-dimensional vectors were linearly dependent. Now, I haven't proved it by any stretch of the imagination, but it is in fact true that that converse direction to the, your claim today was true. You're right. It is if and only if. And it's much more than that because it, it, it gives you essentially just this. If you have EI, um, uh, how can I say this? If you have EI acting on, you know, well, let me say it this way. If you have EI1 wedge EI2 wedge da 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 wedge EIP, right, acting on 
um, v1, v2, da da da, vp, right? And and that's equal to zero for all um, i equal to i1, i2, da da da, ip, in ip, right? Then v1, vp, linearly dependent. The most famous case of this, of course, being the case when p is equal to the dimension of v, in which case you're just looking at the wedge product of e1 through en, and this formula descends to just be the determinant of the n vectors, which you can think of as just the calculation simplifies to a matrix with the n vectors pasted in it, and it's the determinant of the matrix. If the determinant of the matrix of n vectors and n dimensions is non-zero, it's linearly independent. If it's zero, it's linearly dependent. But this captures linear dependence or linear independence for less than n vectors in n dimensions, if you could use it for that. If we became skilled with how to do these calculations, we could, we could understand linear dependence and independence using wedge products. Yeah. Okay, so enough of this, <laughs> because I'm not, I don't think I'm making <laughs> much progress here. I should tell you something much more concrete and interesting. Um, uh, let's see here. Let's see here. Okay. Let me, I'm going to stop the video and start it again in just a couple minutes. I need to go grab some batteries to make sure we don't end up uh,